Another season into the Trey DeJounce era, and while it's nothing new than the first one, it's clear the fit is awkward offensively, it's clear the team is a mess defensively, and it's clear change needs to be made immediately. Outside of the elephant in the room, Jalen Johnson enters the offseason eligible for his rookie extension after having a breakout season. Sadiq Bey enters restricted free agency himself, and long-term starting center Clint Capella enters the last year of his contract. In what could arguably be the biggest offseason of the Trey Young era, let's discuss the roster as it exists, the crucial decisions that have to be made, and what potential trades could exist for Clint, for Trey, and for DeJounte. Trey Young had a great bounce back season, proving he's still an elite offensive engine. He got his third all-star selection, found his groove again from three-point range, and even improved his defensive effort. DeJounte Murray had a better second season at Atlanta, primarily because of when he took over the reins when Trey got injured. The defense still leaves a lot to be desired from his San Antonio days, but he remains a very productive combo guard. Dylan Johnson was arguably the greatest bright spot in Atlanta last season as the former first-round pick who finally solidified himself in the rotation this season may have won most improved player if it wasn't for his injuries. No doubt, Johnson is part of the core moving forward in Atlanta. DeAndre Hunter continues to be fine, but that's about all he is and likely will be at this point. It was a career high in points and three-point percentage, but he continues to deal with injuries and is only good, not great, defensively. Flint continues to be a high motor big with good shot blocking and rebounding even as he approached the age of 30. Unfortunately, the great efficiency started to fall off as he posted his worst efficiency from the field and from the free throw line since becoming a full-time starter. With one year left on his deal and a Kungu's extension kicking in in the upcoming season, it may be the end of Capella's time in Atlanta. Kongu may finally be taking over that starting role, but he didn't exactly win the job over convincingly with his play last season. But as another top six lottery selection that the Hawks have had, they have put plenty of stock into a Kongu. At 6'8", he's certainly undersized, but he could fill a similar role to Capella with the ability to continue improving his mid-range shot and his three-point shooting as we saw flashes of last season. Bogdan Bogdanovich had a great season last year and would have been my pick for sixth man of the year before he started in the lineup too many games during the absence of Trey Young for me to want to consider him for a bench award. He's almost 32, but he continues to be a very valuable scoring punch off the bench and a secondary shot creator. Sadiq Bey was the other regular rotational wing last year for the Hawks, but as he enters restricted free agency on a torn ACL, his future with the Hawks is certainly in doubt. Kobe Bufkin is another player to keep an eye on heading into next season for the Hawks as the 2023 first round pick never really broke into the team. His cutting and on-ball defensive props were attractive to me during the draft process, and that could still become valuable to the Hawks next season. Yes, I am going to address the elephant in the room. We will talk about the situation between Trey and DeJounte, and how that is now affected by the fact that they somehow won the lottery and get into potential trade options for those stars. But first... Let's discuss the decisions the Hawks have to make regarding their wings this offseason, and there's a few of them. As previously mentioned, Sadiq Bey enters restricted free agency after a year and a half in Atlanta. The former Pistons first round pick really struggled from three this year, and that combined with the ACL injury makes it a concern for him entering free agency. Very unfortunate timing for Bey and his potential extension he would have gotten in Atlanta or elsewhere in free agency. As Bay underwent surgery March 27th, it's quite possible he's not back until halfway through next season. That in combination with a poor 23-24 season, and it's very likely there's no big payday waiting for Sadiq this summer. Despite these concerns, I would still expect the Hawks to qualify Sadiq Bay, given his qualifying offer is only $8.5 million. In the case no other team inquires, the Hawks could give another look at Sadiq Bay once he returns for injury on the cheap and it gives Sadiq Bey time to play for a bigger contract. Alternatively, if there is a team that does present an offer sheet, this would allow the Hawks to match it if they so desired. I wouldn't expect the Hawks to match it, but at one year of 8.5 million, it's worth extending the offer. Dylan Johnson becomes extension eligible this offseason, and the Hawks must prioritize locking him up long term. How much he gets paid? Well, that's another question. Obviously, last season was a massive breakout for the young forward, but his potential extension this summer relies on how much potential the Hawks believe Johnson can still tap into. Several young wings got extended last summer or signed in restricted 
free agency, which includes the likes of Matisse Thibel, who got a three-year, $33 million deal from the Trailblazers, thanks to an offer sheet from the Mavericks. Grant Williams, who was paid $53 million over four years via a sign-in trade from the Celtics to the Mavs. Rui Hachimura got $51 million over three years from the Lakers after his playoff performances. P.J. Washington received his three-year deal worth $46.5 million from the Hornets, which is looking like a steal right now for the Mavs. And similarly, the Wizards got a steal of a deal in Denny of Dia, signing for $55 million over four years. Now, all of those are very valuable role players, but Jalen Johnson is coming off of a much better season than any of these wings have had before they signed their extension or contract, and arguably has much greater potential than all of them. And Jalen Johnson and his camp know this and will be unlikely to sign an extension if they don't believe it will match his future value after his fourth year in the league, and understandably so. Danny Evdia is a great example of this going wrong. Sure, $55 million over four years is a great sum of money, and he was partially paid due to upside, but Danny had a breakout season this year. In year four, the year immediately after his extension. A season where he finished 6th in MIP voting and significantly raised his value. He likely would have been getting paid much closer to 17 to 20 plus million a season if he was entering restricted free agency this summer compared to the 13.75 million average he's set to earn on his current extension. A more accurate comparison for a potential Jalen Johnson price point may be the 5 year 131 million extension that Jaden McDaniels earned last season. Point being, the Hawks have to match Johnson's future value or he's very likely to bet on himself and attempt another breakout season. Given the extension and contract given out last year from the Timberwolves to McDaniels, I would expect the Hawks extension for Jalen Johnson to reach 20 million a season at the absolute low end. With this great defense and rebounding, great length and improved three-point shot, Johnson is the perfect two-way wing in the modern NBA, and these guys get massive paydays, and deservedly so. They are a valuable commodity in this league, and there's always a shortage of highly productive two-way wings in the NBA. Don't be shocked if a Jalen Johnson extension ends up being anywhere from 22 to 28 million a season. He's earned every penny, and it will be money very well spent by the Hawks. Another player who could get extended this summer is franchise cornerstone Trey Young. Now, whether the Hawks are going to extend Trey Young or not, of course, will depend on what direction they are headed this offseason. If the plan is to trade DeJounte Murray and fully commit to Trey Young, offering the max extension makes sense to push a potential unrestricted free agency further down the line. However, if the plan is to trade Trey Young, obviously he won't be extended. And even still, even if the extension is offered, there's no guarantee he's going to accept it. The other notable extension eligible player is Clint Capella, who notably did get an extension the last time he was extension eligible, having signed a two-year $46 million extension in 2021. This time around, extending him is not such an obvious decision, and certainly not at another extension that puts him earning $23 million a season. The Anika Kongu extension kicks in this year whilst Capella enters the final year of his contract before entering unrestricted free agency. Although it is possible, I find it hard to believe the Hawks are going to re-sign a 30-year-old Capella during the 2025 offseason when Okongwu is set to be paid $15 million during that same season. This begs the question, do the Hawks keep Capella and let him leave for free after the season, or do the Hawks trade him to improve the team elsewhere and finally make Okongwu the starting center? I'd argue the very obvious choice is to trade Capella. Now, to be fair, this is the third consecutive offseason I have been advocating for a Kongu to start and for Capella to be traded. So I do have some bias here. But with the Kongu's extension kicking in, the expiring contract of Capella, combined with the continued development of a Kongu and the efficiency drop from Capella, it's time for a Capella trade, finally. Now, the issue with a Capella trade is that the list of teams potentially interested in such a trade are likely quite limited, and the value probably isn't great. The Memphis Grizzlies are one of the more notable teams looking for a center after trading away the injured Steven Adams last season. Now, Capella is very unlikely to be their first option, with them possibly inquiring into Nicholas Claxton in free agency, but Capella could help replace some of the rebounding of Steven Adams whilst being a great lob threat with Jaw. You could argue the Grizzlies may only be willing to give up a couple of second round picks instead of a protected first, but this would be the rough framework. Luke Kennard would be involved in any such deal to make the money work, and Zaire Williams gives the Hawks another young forward with some upside who's going to be on the outside of the rotation to Memphis thanks to the great play last season of Gigi Jackson and Vince Williams Jr. 
Now this trade is significantly more unlikely, but it could be a last ditch blockbuster effort for the Hawks. You could argue the Hawks should give up another first round pick here, which the Hawks do have at their disposal, but this is the rough framework. Although Sabonis in terms of pure talent would be a great addition, there's a few issues with this trade for the Hawks. Firstly, defense is already one of the primary concerns for this roster, and acquiring Sabonis certainly isn't helping that, not to mention the fact this still keeps a Kongwu on the bench whilst you're paying a significant amount of money at the center position. Secondly, the Hawks, whether it be with Trey Young or DeJounte Murray, revolves around plenty of lobs to Capella, Kongwu, and Jalen Johnson, and of course, formerly John Collins. Savonis is not a lob threat. He's a great passer, a great rebounder, could be a very good hub to run dribble handoffs off of, but that requires plenty of good off-ball movement shooters, and outside of Bogdan Bogdanovich, and if he stayed around on the team Trey Young, the Hawks don't exactly have those types of players. Thirdly, the departure of DeAndre Hunter and possibly even AJ Griffin would destroy the Hawks' wing depth, leaving only Jalen Johnson and possibly Sadiq Bey if he's re-signed, and even still, he won't likely be healthy to start the season. The point being, such a big trade with Capella likely doesn't help the Hawks' issues. I'd expect a smaller trade such as the one proposed to the Grizzlies, or possibly even one to the Pelicans, where the Hawks get some picks to use, possibly in a future trade, or an okay young talent in return is the most likely route for a Capella trade this offseason. Now, before we get to the Trey and DeJounte discussion, I want to quickly mention the other elephant in the room. Now, when I was initially writing this video, the Hawks' first-round draft pick was a minute point with very little discussion around it. However, the draft lottery very much changed that when they won it and got the first overall pick. Now, this gives the Hawks plenty more options with this offseason. With where they want to go with the selection, with where they want to go with Trey Young and DeJounte Murray, they could do a multitude of things. Firstly, the Hawks could simply use the pick to pair with whatever combination of Murray and Young they want to keep. Secondly, the Hawks could trade the number one overall pick alongside other assets, likely a package involving DeJounte Murray, for another high-end star. Thirdly, the Hawks could make this the time to completely hit the reset button, trade Trey and DeJounte Murray, draft Alex Saar, and let him be the future of your franchise alongside Jalen Johnson. And of course, if you draft Saar, the Capella gets traded, the, you don't need three bigs. Point being, they could do anything. Personally, I think Alex Saar is an amazing fit next to Trey Young. And although Capella, Akongu, and formerly John Collins have been good vertical threats who catch constant lobs from Trey, the seven foot one Alex Saar would be the greatest vertical spacer and offensive big Trey has ever played with from day one. Not to mention the fact that Saar has shown promise of upside as a three point shooter, giving way more floor spacing potential than Capella ever has, with his seven five wingspan offering way more upside as a rim protector on the defensive end than Capella has ever offered as well. Trey Young, Jalen Johnson, and Alex Saar is a legitimately good trio. As the Hawks enter Trey's 26-year-old season with two years of team control left on his contract, this is likely the last shot to build a roster that convinces Trey to stay in Atlanta, and I believe the young duo of Jalen Johnson and Alex Saar is the best duo they're going to be able to surround him with, and also a quite good one. Now, the fact we're just now getting to the Trey Young and DeJounte Murray situation tells you how crucial of an offseason it is in Atlanta and how many other big decisions must take place surrounding their two star guards. Now, evidently, based on my last point, I believe DeJounte Murray is the odd man out here. Trey is the best player on the team, and so if the Hawks want to remain competitive, keeping Trey Young is the best way forward, but clearly, these two cannot coexist. Parity is at an all time high in the NBA. None of the last six NBA champions have made the conference finals the following year. Not to mention the fact the Pacers, led by Halliburton, Siakam, and Miles Turner, have made a deep playoff run this year. Ray Young, Jalen Johnson, and Alex Saar won't be there next season, nor do the Hawks have the high-impact role players the Pacers currently have, but the Hawks' core has the chance to develop up to that trio of the Pacers, and the DeJounte Murray trade gives the Hawks the chance to add more quality role players. And of course, the previously discussed trade of Clint Capella will likely happen, allowing a center rotation of Saar and Okongwu, and adding potentially another valuable role player in return, all within this hypothetical of drafting Saar and trading DeJounte. So the question is, what do you get in return for DeJounte Murray to surround your new core three? 
Now, picks are great, but ultimately the Hawks need great defense around Trey Young now, not in the future via draft picks. And ideally, these dudes can also space the floor. They need role players who can make an immediate impact in return for DeJounte in an ideal world. If the Hawks want to make a big splash and get a cream of the crop quote unquote role player, a trade could be made with the Brooklyn Nets. And you guys probably know where this is going. Now, I know the Nets have seemed reluctant to trade Mikhail Bridges, even though they most definitely should. However, I believe this trade gives the Nets a happy medium. They could remain competitive, or at least try to act competitive, whilst they don't have their own draft picks. Acquiring DeJounte Murray will keep you in the mix for the play-in tournament, something Murray has done with the Hawks and the Spurs, whilst also getting another young player to potentially develop in A.J. Griffin. For the Hawks, while well, they get wing defense and depth that they desperately need, Trey would have a new second option than Mikhail Bridges, a second option who is much more comfortable playing off of the ball, and is a significantly better defender. That duo alongside the emergence of Jalen Johnson would be a trio that complement each other as opposed to the current clashing styles of Trey and DeJounte. And this now makes your big three that we talked about earlier with Trey, Jalen Johnson, and Alex Sar a big four with the addition of Mikhail Bridges. Dorian Finney-Smith would also come in to bring more wing defense and length off of the Hawks bench, further helping their defensive issues. Now, it's such a trade that raises the question of the role of DeAndre Hunter. It's possible the Hawks could trade him with a new abundance of wings on the roster, but given his low value and some of the recent positional play in Mikhail Bridges, one could argue that Bridges could start at the two alongside DeAndre Hunter and Jalen Johnson, all in the starting lineup, allowing the Hawks to have some absurd length and defensive intensity around Trey Young. Now, this trade by no means solves all of the Hawks' problems, nor does it make them an immediate top playoff contender, but the fit improves significantly, and the defense improves significantly. And if someone similar to Luke Kennard can give the Hawks another off-ball movement shooter, this Hawks team could really be unlocked. Honestly, it's hard to find a team that makes sense in terms of acquiring DeJounte Murray this offseason. However, another potential option could be the Warriors. The Warriors are likely to see Clay Thompson leave this offseason and may look to replace him as one last push during the Curry era. Wiggins has been struggling significantly as of late, and the Warriors could look to move off of him. However, the Hawks could hope to get back a very valuable 3 and D wing. Moses Moody could be another very valuable piece. He's been very underutilized and given inconsistent minutes in the Bay, but could offer great 3 and D minutes off the bench. You could argue the amount of pick compensation, but there's a rough framework here that could give the Hawks more depth to surround Trey Young. Ultimately, this is a crucial offseason for the Hawks that should see significant change. If there isn't significant change, well, then it's a failure of an offseason and a failure of the Trey Young era. Despite many mediocre seasons over the last few years, the Hawks still have upside and opportunities to salvage this era with Trey Young, greatly helped by winning the lottery. But this offseason is the time that they have to make changes before it all falls apart and the changes come too late.